So my topic was uh, improving the financial fact-testing accuracy. And the specific uh, idea that I'm exploring is uh, moving from candle data to tick data to facilitate this improvement. And so, kind of, yeah. So uh, basically, uh, the candle data is the current standard format that uh, almost all of the financial data is handled in. And you can see it here on the left. Um, you might, you, if you have been looking at any financial data, you've probably seen this before, uh, but just to make sure that uh, everyone is on board. So the candle data is kind of a uh, compressed data format where you uh, take some uh, time period, for example, uh, one minute or one hour or one day, and uh, you compress it to, into five numbers, which are the opening price, closing price, uh, high price and low price, and then the total uh, trade volume during that period. And that's uh, really how all the financial backtesting is done and how all the uh, charts are analyzed and so on. Uh, then uh, the alternative way that I'm exploring is to use the raw tick level data, meaning that uh, the data includes all the individual uh, trades that uh, happen on the market. You can see an example on the right. Uh, these are not from the same time period. So uh, this uh, tick data is not from this uh, candle data. Uh, tick data is uh, not as readily available as the candle data. So this is from the system of the uh, company that I'm doing the thesis for. So, uh, yeah. Um, the uh, How I went forward this is that uh, first a simple test algorithm was designed. And now the this purpose of this test algorithm, algorithm is to simply generate the data. Uh, we are not testing the algorithm itself. We are testing the backtest system. Uh, but we need some algorithm just to simply generate the data. Uh, how the algorithm works isn't really that important uh, for the results. It simply needs to generate some uh, traits that we can then later try to simulate and uh, see how well the simulator simulation uh, matches the reality. And then uh, to have something that we can actually compare against, uh, I did a live run on real markets where the algorithm uh, uh, did trading with real money. Uh, so we get uh, like a one week of results uh, on how it actually functions. And then we take the data from that exact same uh, time period and the same assets. And then we can run uh, back tests against that same data. So then we can compare uh, how well do those back tests resemble the uh, real trading performance. And uh, of course, the point of the algorithm is uh, not to make profit or anything like that here, but the uh, point is, yeah, just to generate trades. And then the uh, point of the mm, accurate backtesting system is to match those trades as well as possible. Uh, some numbers about the uh, data that was uh, received. And uh, as you can see, uh, the test period was only one week, uh, but uh, due to the high frequency, the nature of the algorithm, uh, there were quite a uh, or the amount of data is uh, totally sufficient for this uh, kind of analysis. And I tested the tick data and then two different periods of candles and uh, to see uh, if the uh, candle period would uh, heavily affect the results. And well, uh, here are the results themselves. Um, so what these uh, graphs measure is the cumulative error. So uh, they measure the difference between the backtest result and the actual real result that was gotten from the uh, markets, uh, live markets. And well, as the results show, the uh, tick data-based backtest is uh, much, much more accurate. Um, and then we can also see that uh, uh, there's a considerable difference between the one minute candle and the much more granular uh, 10 second candle uh, data. So uh, we can see that uh, as the period, period of the candle decreases, uh, the error also decreases. So 
And that's uh, pretty much natural because you can decrease the period of candle like indefinitely until it only includes uh, one trade or one tick of data. And at this point, running the candle test and tick test is uh, kind of equivalent. And there are two graphs. Uh, one is the cumulative error and the other is the absolute cumulative error. And the, uh, there's the curious feature that uh, sometimes uh, or quite often the uh, sign of the errors uh, uh, during a given period is uh, uh, different. So uh, different signed errors can actually cancel each other out, which is uh, what happens in the real backtest uh, quite a bit. So that's where, uh, why the, I have considered the both alternatives. But the uh, normal cumulative error where the canceling happens is what you actually would get out of the uh, backtest. And we can see that uh, tick-based backtests uh, are actually uh, surprisingly accurate, like the error is really, really small. And yeah, so then we can uh, uh, take a look at the more kind of in-depth situation to uh, try to understand uh, where these uh, bigger errors uh, for candle data come from. And uh, here's, uh, here's one example where the uh, this uh, these two graphs are from the same time period, uh, they are one minute, and uh, the right one is the uh, kind of a candle data, which has uh, the four price data points, and the left one is the uh, tick data. And we can see that uh, the candle um, candle data kind of loses the uh, all the price movement that happens inside that uh, period of the candle. And here the uh, the squares are the trades that are uh, simulated. And we can see that the left one uh, cuts the trades correctly because it has more information on the uh, price movement. And the right one, which is the uh, candle simulation, not only does it miss the sell trade, but also the buy trade is uh, happening at the wrong place uh, at the wrong price. And yeah, these kind of uh, uh, small scale uh, differences are where the uh, the cumulative error actually comes from. Then I have uh, another example. Um, here the uh, more uh, here the candle data uh, simulation makes a trade execution, but the tick uh, data simulation does not. And the reason is that. Uh, the uh, price decreases rather gradually, uh, which is captured with the tick data. But uh, in the candle data, uh, since the it only includes four values, um, the uh, decrease in the price is much more sharp. So uh, it then uh, executes the trade uh, uh, with that uh, specific algorithm. But this uh, phenomenon should happen well pretty much on any algorithm that. Uh, that you can think of. And finally, uh, I did some experimenting on how does the uh, frequency of the algorithm impact the results? Um, so the idea was uh, originally to test this uh, for kind of a high frequency algorithms that uh, trade uh, multiple times a day. But uh, then to, yeah, <laughs> to find out if these results hold for uh, algorithms that uh, operate uh, at much lower frequency, uh, the algorithm was modified so that the uh, spread, meaning uh, how easily it will uh, make trades, uh, was increased, meaning that uh, it doesn't make as many trades. And then the update period of the algorithm, meaning how often it uh, updates its state based on market data was also decreased to make it a more low frequency uh, algorithm. Uh, and we can see that uh, when the frequency decreases, uh, the difference between tick and candle data backtest uh, decreases too. So the benefit from moving from candles to ticks uh, is much greater when, the, when you are testing some high frequency algorithm compared to a relatively uh, low frequency algorithm. And yeah, those are the main results from the thesis. Um, uh, this was uh, probably quite a, quite a bit of information in quite a short time, um, but uh, 
the thesis itself, of course, includes much, much more uh, of everything. But uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, looks very good. Are there any questions from the audience? So if not at the moment, then I would start. Yeah, did I understand correctly the, the main theme or the main goal of the thesis was to understand how much information is lost by going from ticked data to candle data? Yes, and uh, specifically, how how does the information affect the uh, backtesting accuracy? Because in uh, earlier literature, the kind of assumption has been that uh, uh, information loss is not significant uh, to the results, so that okay. uh, it doesn't really matter that some of the information is lost, the results are still applicable. Uh, but here we can see that uh, uh, that might not actually be the case since the uh, kind of error in the backtest increases uh, massively with the uh, candle data compared to the dictate data. And there are a uh, few uh, earlier literature pieces that uh, kind of uh, uh, consider the same problem and they call it like the... Uh, one quote was that the biggest uh, error in financial modeling. And yeah, so that's uh, kind of where the idea for this came from. Uh, those literature pieces kind of uh, just recognize this error, but they don't uh, really uh, test or propose uh, any solutions to this. And then uh, the move from candle to dictator is uh, one possi possible solution to this problem. Okay, so <laughs> this... Uh... In terms of this <clears throat> machine learning modeling framework that, that I like very much, uh, that, that I would also like to see in your thesis where you clearly define, for example, what the data point is. Uh, as I understood, this might be a period of time. And the features are, are the, the observations. So this is either tick data or candle data. So this choice between candle and tick data is, is a form of feature selection in machine learning terms. As yes. So, yeah. So basically, uh, around here, I have a uh, kind of formulated the these are the two alternative like uh, uh, problem sets that we are comparing here. The, like there's uh, uh, this problem of uh, how uh, what trades are executed, and this is the the traditional input set, which is the uh, the candle data, and then the different orders that the algorithm has. And then from the, those, you need to calculate the uh, uh, executions. And this is the alternative proposal that we are testing here. So these are the kind of a, uh, two uh, feature sets that uh, we are comparing here. Oh, and I see also here, yeah, this was my next question. What are the labels? So what do you want to predict? And what do you use for computing the errors and accuracies? So it, yes. it so the, you, yeah. Yeah, I uh, actually have a, one section here discussing how the errors are measured because you can kind of measure them from uh, trade to trade. Uh, instead, you need to uh, kind of a, so here's the kind of a way how the, yeah well this chapter discusses how the how you measure the accuracy of a backtesting system or how you measure the error that the backtesting system produces. But uh, and this, but but this should also be uh, somewhat uh, explained briefly in the beginning when you when you set the stage of the of the research uh, topic right. and research question. Or could you show us the research question if if you have formulated it explicitly? Yes. So there are a bunch of research questions. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this probably would need some reformulation. But uh, the first one is to to test if this hypothesis holds uh, and the hypothesis is that uh, moving from uh, candle data to dig data uh, actually increases the accuracy of the simulation. Yeah, and here, yeah. here you mentioned already backtest result accuracy. So this seems to be the criterion, the, the, the loss function in machine learning terms. So yes. do you explain, I mean, your, your background is more from, from, from finance, financial engineering. Um, yeah. So 
somebody who is from there might have no problem in clearing over. But for me, for example, it would be important that in the beginning you provide some background for me that, that allows to interpret this backtest result accuracy concept. So, yes. all right. Uh, yeah, I maybe uh, I could move it from the the later part to this uh, uh, like a beginning section, and then in the uh, I also talk in the kind of a background uh, part of the thesis more about what the, what all the uh, different things mean actually, and uh, uh, yeah. Could you could you also blend it in somehow in in the very beginning, so before section one one. When you when you provide the introduction, could you add a bit more detail there so I could have a better idea what 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 you mean by backtest uh, result accuracy? Yeah, sure. I can add uh, a section about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, looks very good. You you done already a lot of uh, work, so it's now mostly about writing up, uh, wrapping up. Yes. The thesis. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. kind of a adding all the uh, needed sections and uh, finishing touches and so on. So like most of the writing has been done at this point. Yes. All right. So I, I like this research questions uh, very much that you have a separate section. Uh, do you then close it or answer it, answer the research questions in the in the final section? Uh, yes. It would uh, be important. Yes. Uh, after the results, I have the, like a discussion section where I... Uh, go through these uh, research questions and I talk about how uh, how well does the results answer this and uh, what are, then after that, uh, what are the implications? Very good, very good. Do you also point out in which way you you uh, expand the current uh, knowledge? So what what is known in the literature about these questions or answering these questions and what you add? So this would also be important. The, the contribution, the new thing that your thesis work provides to the academia. Yes, uh, I could have maybe clarify that in the final sections, but the, basically uh, the earlier literature has identified this problem with the candle data, and yeah. there haven't really been uh, many suggestions on how to fix the problem. So uh, this thesis kind of uh, presents one uh, pretty, in my opinion, pretty good uh, alternative uh, solution to the uh, earlier problem that has been discovered. Yeah. Very good. This must be uh, clarified. So you must tell this point. Clearly yeah, all right. In the thesis somewhere. Uh, for okay. example, in the introduction or in the conclusion where you make the point again. So now these results here allow to conclude this. So we have this finding and this finding extends or goes beyond this and that existing work or literature. All right. Very good, very good. Uh, what else? Yeah, what I like to see uh, somewhere core problem formulation here. Do you have a, a section two about the problem setting? Uh, so this here, for example, is this detail what I see now in section one two. This yeah. might be worth a, a dedicated section two problem setting where you formulate formalize the application as a machine learning problem. So I see already here that you define the feature vectors, that you define the labels, which is exactly what I would like to see. Uh, then you could also maybe define here the, the error measures. You use absolute errors or absolute values of differences. Yeah, all right. I could uh, add that to this section, yeah. Yeah, and also point out, as I understood, you're not so interested in developing new algorithms for predicting y uh, from x. So this is not in your in your main interest. You're no, so... interested that the, the effect of using one feature, yes. distinct features compared to candle features. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. Very good. All right. Thanks a lot for the update. Yeah, this is uh, uh, very well on the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions um, from other audience members? Yes, please. Anybody else who is working on a master thesis or on a research project uh, for applied machine learning, this is pretty similar uh, anatomy, I would say. Uh, 
regarding the structure of the of the thesis document or project report? If not, then I would maybe quickly share something that I found. So just just again, uh, m one of my main research topics is uh, federated learning. So we have a bunch of, of local data sets. So each local data set might be generated by a person, like when you go shopping and a machine learning app could then be to predict uh, food recommendations based on your personal behavior. But uh, when you want to train a very powerful model, a deep neural network, you need a lot of training data that these small local data sets, this personal data sets, so this might be Alex, Alex data set is too small for training a complicated model. So we must find other persons, Timo or Toivo, uh, who also have small local data sets, but we could share, we could pool them together and get a sufficiently large data sets to train, <coughs> excuse me, to train a deep neural network. The question then is of course, how do we find those? So how do we find out if local data sets could be useful for adding to a training set if these local data sets are themselves way too small to train the model? So is there some in-between space between train uh, the, the required size to train a model and the required size of a data set to find out if this data set would be good to add to my training set? And uh, my belief is yes, there is a big space there in between, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure yet what is the best method uh, or broadly applicable method to find out which local data set should I pool. Uh, and here in this regard, I would like to point out something that I came across just a few days ago. And I was very surprised that I didn't find, uh, didn't stumble across it earlier. It's called neural structure structure learning or uh, neural structured learning. And this is of course a TensorFlow package, a TensorFlow library. And this is exactly the setting that I'm uh, we are interested in. So we have structure in the form of uh, local data sets like dog images. And the structure is similarities between local data sets. And these similarities, they are, they are hints for which local data sets should be pulled together. And then there is one, one uh, suite of methods that is called graph regularization using synthesized graphs. And this synthesized graphs is just another wo a word for learning the similarity between local data sets. So there's already a big TensorFlow package that does the job for us or that uh, provides methods that could be used to find out if two local data sets are similar and therefore should be pulled together for a training set. So I'm just uh, still, I'm still amazed <laughs> that this package exists and still try to play around with this methods. And as I understood, so here's this builder graph section. So how does it work? It uses, uh, it uses uh, embeddings, sample embeddings. So embeddings uh, or deep learning embeddings are methods that map uh, some object to a, a Euclidean space. So, and this object could be a local data set. So these embeddings can be used to map uh, a local data set to a, to a two-dimensional space. So you would have Let's go back to my whiteboard. So we we would use an embedding, and actually, this picture here is is already an embedding because this local data set that I've shown here might be very non-numeric data. Might be uh, text, uh, my comments on a shopping platform, might be time signals from my GPS coordinates when I go to Kmarket. And what I did already here in this illustration, I embedded this data set on a two-dimensional space like this this space here, my drawing plane. And once you have embedded the data point here as a point in this two-dimensional plane, you can use a K, a K means clustering. So you could use good old clustering methods to say, okay, this data point here is closer. So let's combine those, let's cluster those. And the, the crux of this whole approach, I guess, or I believe is 
the quality or the usefulness of these embedding methods. So do we have a method that maps a local data set into a useful representation in a two-dimensional space? And once we are in a two-dimensional space, so once we have represented a local data set by two coordinates, we can feed those two coordinates into a clustering algorithm like k-means or soft clustering using Gaussian mixture models. And then we can cluster and find out which local data sets we should pull together. So this is what I wanted to share in, in this meeting with you. Uh, and I also want to encourage you to, where do I have it? To explore this neural structured learning framework. So, but maybe my question to you would be now, did anyone of you know already about this neural structured learning framework? Nope. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It, it's good you called, called, called this out. I saw the link. Um, you know, actually, Alex, I, uh, for the computer science project, um, for the other course, I'm doing um, a topic uh, for you that's very much this, I think. <laughs> so this this will be very useful. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Yeah, I was wondering because this is not this is actually not too new, this at least at least two or three years old. And I was a bit surprised that it went beyond my attention, below my attention. But this might be also because I'm not I'm more from a signal processing community, but I should be more aware of this TensorFlow website yeah it's it's quite amazing because it basically there are also nice tutorial videos how to generate these graphs but yeah i mean it looks super handy super useful but if it's uh, uh then it kind of is a silver bullet and solves the problem for most applications i don't know this is to be determined determined and this depends on how well do these embeddings work so how well do this uh, deep learning methods map local data sets, which can be very different data types. How well do these embeddings map them into uh, Euclidean spaces? But I guess this is, I would say, a, 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 key, a core problem of all deep learning. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so anybody else having questions, comments, uh, suggestions? If not, then thanks a lot for the meeting and uh, wish you a nice uh, fall holiday week. See you next week. Bye. Take care, everyone.